1987, South African Airways Flight 295 from Taiwan to Johannesburg crashed in the Indian Ocean east of Mauritius. The cockpit voice recorder was later salvaged in 4,900 metres of water, which is a huge accomplishment, especially at the time. The ROV that performed this incredible deep water feat was called the Gemini. Only mention it because now there's a new Gemini ROV in town. Nothing to do with the original, but firmly aimed at deep water operations. It's been developed by Schilling Robotics and will be operated by its parent company, Technip FMC. Well done, they both. Now, at one time, the market was divided into smaller electric ROVs able to carry out observation tasks and larger hydraulic vehicles designed for subsea intervention. Now, by the time the original Germany appeared, these boundaries had already started to become less distinct, with modern electric vehicles now able to carry out a huge percentage of tasks once solely the domain of hydraulic work class ROVs. In fact, over the past few years, market leading companies well established in the hydraulic end of the sector have now begun to offer very sophisticated electrical uh, work class ROVs and even ROV AUV hybrids. So, did Schilling travel in this direction when designing its latest ROV? No. Instead of extending its operations into new markets, the designers decided a better strategy would be to concentrate its efforts on the things it already performed and invent new ways of carrying those out more efficiently. So, what sort of operations? Well, one operation requires pumping hundreds of litres of intervention fluid into underwater facilities. So, the designers incorporated a pair of 55 gallons, that's over 200 litres, of auxiliary fluid reservoirs and a 25 gallon waste fluid reservoir not on a skid actually in the body of the ROV itself and they said dealing with these sort of large volumes of fluid it made no sense whatsoever not to use a hydraulic medium for vehicle and thruster power. Now a more typical application would be to turn valves on or off on subsea structures that sort of stuff. The conventional method for this is for the ROV to use its port grabber to grip the rails on the intervention panel to stabilise the ROV and then use the jaws on the more dexterous manipulator arm on the starboard side to grab a torque tool by its handle and insert its tip into a torque bucket. Similar sort of procedure with stabbing an injection tool into an interface. While this is a fairly routine operation, it's still no easy matter for the pilot who has to view the entire operation in two dimensions through a remote camera and the strong underwater currents don't really help. I mean, even a slight misalignment of the angle can cause the tool to jam as it enters a receptacle and further pushing against the offset can create tremendous amounts of force, possibly causing the entire ROV to rebound backwards. Worse, it can damage the hot stab or the receptacle. And it's also far from uncommon for the tool's handle to slip from the ROV jaws, requiring the ROV pilot to spend a lot of time retrieving the thing. So, instead of using manipulated jaws to grab the various tool handles, the new system that Schilling has pioneered effectively assimilates the tools into the manipulator arm. The new tool assemblies are engaged and disengaged at the wrist. And they've designed numerous interchangeable tools. There's torque tools, cutting devices, hub cleaner brushes, grinders, valve tools, even parallel and finger jaws. Each latches onto the end of the manipulator arm through a unified interface using sophisticated bayonet movement to ensure all the internals align together. Attaching the tool at the wrist and not at the jaw fingers brings a considerable number of advantages. Wrist cameras can give pilots a much better view of the operation. However, incorporating pressure sensors within the wrist provides an unrivaled level of feedback to the control system, further assisting the pilots. So as the tools push forward, sensors distributed 360 degrees around the wrist can detect moments between the tool and the assets and translate this into movement resistance. Software takes the pressure data and automatically micro-adjusts the tool angle in real time until resistance falls to zero and then the tool can be inserted freely. And all this is done without the pilot even being aware of it. The designers have actually taken this semi-automation 
one step further. Instead of relying on pressure sensors, they developed an integrated approach using the whole ROV. Five machine vision cameras on the vehicle, including two on the manipulators themselves, are used to manoeuvre the entire ROV into the correct position. And this positioning is assisted by the use of a sort of QR code. And this helps the machine vision cameras recognise true 3D perspective. The code has other uses as well. It's like if you can link it to a database, the pilot could learn the, the last time the work was carried out, how many turns and what torque was applied. It could also identify when fluid is inject when was last injected, to which port, and the volumes or pressures applied at the time. It'd be quite possible to carry this out fully autonomously, but the system designers consider this unacceptable, given the inherent danger and the issues that could happen if a problem occurred. The pilot, in this case, always remains in the in ultimate control. It doesn't remove the human, human factor, but it does reduce it. In order to carry out this semi-autonomous action, it's vital the platform is as stable as possible. The Gemini system is underpinned by a software-driven control centre called Station Keep. The ROV incorporates a number of advanced positional control and stability systems fed by third-party navigational tools like uh, well, Veilport's Mini IPS depth sensor, um, Xblue's Octan's Nano motion reference unit, and Teledyne's RDI Pioneer 600 kHz Doppler velocity log. I mean, you get the picture. This and other information is fed into Station Keep, and this gives the ROV the ability to maintain position within an inch and 25 millimeters watch circle in currents exceeding two knots. I mean, this is really important because it means that it isn't necessary to anchor the vehicle by using the grab rail. And this in turn means it's possible to use two manipulators rather than a manipulator and a grab. Two manipulators increase the speed and scope of work that the vehicle ca can carry out. In fact, it was actually having this ability to use twin manipulators that gave Gemini its name. I've just remembered that they've, they're calling it Gemini, not Gemini. So, conventionally, the handle of the hot stab would be held in the jaws and an external hose would introduce the injection fluid. Now, these free hanging flexible hoses are weak points they can get easily damaged. And if the new system has tooling integrated into the arm, how does the power or hydraulic fluid feed get to it? And the answer is through conduits permanently installed inside the manipulator arm. There are no external hoses or cables to disconnect and reconnect when switching between the tools, just a simple latching process. In fact, there are nine fluid passages running from the base all the way to the wrist. These fluid passages are also accompanied by power and communication lines. And this opens up a new generation of smart tool, such as positioning sensors for jaw tools or a new intelligent talk tool. If you, in future, it could even be possibly used to communicate with external systems. Like its predecessors, the Gemini has been designed to work at extreme depths, where the journey between the surface and the work site can take hours. So, to obviate commuting back to the surface for interchange tooling, most ROVs have a dedicated tooling receptacle somewhere in the vehicle, typically between the uh, manipulator and the grab. Typical ROVs have two to four tools in a single dive. Well, instead of a general storage receptacle, a key feature on the new Gemini ROV is a novel tooling carousel. You can see it here. Let's close up. Let's get rid of the background. There, the tool belt has a capacity for up to 15 tools and the manipulator control software always knows the exact location of the designated slot. As both are part of the ROV, its positions never vary. Some equipment spaces don't actually contain tools, but provide a testing function, say to verify the torque output or to be assigned pressure calibration for the um, hot stabs. And these allow the operator to verify a tool can, say, exert a pressure of 500 psi before it's actually inserted into a live system. But what if the operator requires a greater number of tools? Well, Schilling Robotics engineers have designed a similar carousel system in the top hat tether management system, 
to accommodate, to accommodate another 15 tools. Gemini, Gemini can be called upon to perform tasks that require both high power and the ability to pump large volumes of fluid. The main HPU is a 250 horsepower system, but the vehicle also houses an auxiliary HPU called ISOL 8. Now, this isn't new, it's been available on previous UHD systems, but it's still worth a look. The package is about the same size as a briefcase, while most competitive intervention systems probably require an additional skid. They're probably weighing a couple of tons. The isolate system consists of eight separate reciprocating pumps that can work in parallel with each other. API 53 compatible systems have to be able to actuate BOP shear rams, shear and seal in 45 seconds or less, and this requires an output of 50 gallons a minute of fluid at 5000 psi. And in this case, the user simply dials in the details into the control console and the pump automatically does the rest. And there we have it. If you want to know more about subsea engineering, read UT2, the magazine and online magazine of the Society for Underwater Technology. The SUT is beginning a new publication in 2021 focusing specifically on underwater vehicles. Instead of UT2, it's going to be called UV2. And it'll be an online-only publication, but they might print hard copy. Thank you very much.